So first of all, I would like to thank Professor Albert for having me here, uh, to inviting me this uh, wonderful conference. And I must, I must accept and confess that the last two days have been a great learning experience. Uh, so much of theoretical stuff which I am not really used to. Uh, but I don't have I don't have any theoretical model to show here. I'll be basically talking about the adoption of technology or technological upgradation in India, generally and specifically in the Indian manufacturing sector, and what has been its uh, implication for labor, various kind of labor. And since Sebastian has given a, such a wonderful presentation on the theme, I don't know if I will be able to hold your attention or not. Uh, nevertheless, I'll try. And since I'm going to focus on one sector on one particular country, Maybe you will find it uh, very interesting. Maybe, I, I'm not sure. Uh, so there has been a lot of talk on the technology and its possible negative consequences on labor. Uh, but this is not the first time. Uh, almost all technological revolution in the past has generated this kind of fear that technology is going to eat out the jobs and we may Face, we may see a long-term increase in uh, the structural, uh, structural unemployment. And similar kind of fears are being pushed forward over the last two decades or so, specifically in the developed world. Uh, some policy, uh, some, some public speaker actually have tried to push forward the idea of this workless world. Uh, basic argument is that if the technological progress in digital sphere continues at this pace, we very soon will enter, enter into a phase where we will not need human labor at all. So science fiction kind of a environment where machines will be performing all sorts of work. But if we go by history, uh, this kind of fear has not been materialized. And mainstream economists have always tried to dispel this kind of fear simply because they assume that there are some inbuilt mechanism which can counterbalance the negative, initial negative impact of technological upgradation or technological progress on labor. And some of these uh, counter me uh, counterbalance mechanisms are like uh, job creation through new products. So when, you, when techno new technology come into picture, it, dip, it dis displays labor in the traditional sector. But at the same time, uh, due to this very technological revolution or technological upgradation, some new sector emerges. So the labor demand in those sectors goes up. So it counterbalances the negative impact in the traditional sector. Apart from this, uh, technological revolution always improves the labor productivity. So the unit cost goes down. And if the benefit of this reduction in unit cost is passed to the consumer, the overall demand goes up which can counterbalance the negative impact on labor. Similarly, uh, increase in investment. If the, if the benefits of reduction in un unit cost is not passed to the consumer, then the profit of the uh, entrepreneur goes up, and he will invest in the new, uh, new kind of production units, so it will increase the demand of labor. Uh, similarly, another channel works through decrease in wage and bounce back to the labor intensive technology. And similarly, I mean, uh, one or two years back, uh, SE Maglu have similar kind of a model where it shows that uh, due to the uh, technological progress, uh, if you have flexible labor market, so demand for labor goes down and it leads to the reduction in wage rate. And at, its, at a certain point, uh, new technological innovation becomes uh, not, not viable. So then it will bring to the end of technological innovation, labor saving technological innovation, and people will revert back to the labor intensive technology. Uh, another channel works through this, uh, which is basically Keynesian uh, Caldorian tradition, which works through the trade union and increase in income. Basically, uh, when labor cost goes, uh, labor, uh, when the labor productivity goes up and trade unions are very active, they participate in the uh, uh, determination of wage rate. So the, a part of that uh, benefit is passed to the labor, their wages goes up, and consequently the total uh, demand in the economy goes up. Now, uh, all these mechanisms have their flaws. And it has been argued that they may not be, these kind of channels may not work today. Like uh, 
this increase in wage rate, it basically depends upon whether you have very active trade unions or not. And some people argue that in the present situation, the trade unions and the strength of trade, trade union has declined significantly. So this, this mechanism may not be applicable right now. Uh, similarly, this decrease in wage, uh, in the words of Asimoglu, if computer keeps on growing, productivity and, and the technological revolution in computer se sector keeps on growing at a very fast rate, then we may not see this kind of channel working. But despite all sorts of drawback, these mechanism or the traditional theory has withheld the test of time because despite all sorts of technological revolution in past, we have not witnessed any increase in structural unemployment for a very long time. So it seems that, uh, and the economists get a lot of heart out of this historical experience. And that they say that even this uh, phase of technological revolution will not result in mass unemployment. Uh, Yes, but that's good. You get, yeah. No, but if, 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 I mean, I, so maybe I, maybe I, maybe, yeah, it's good, but, but I mean, uh, it's good if you get some job and if you, if you look at and read this, some of the literature regarding end of work, and I must quote someone, um, one of the CEO, American-based company, he made a statement that future factory will, will have two employees, one dog and one human being. So in that case, if that is true, then we are doomed. <laughs> okay. Okay, I mean, that was just, uh, you can say, overview. I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, even I'm not concerned about the negative impact of technology. But... <laughs> anyway, I mean, uh, though uh, technology may not have a very significant impact on the overall demand of labor, but technology still impacts labor by changing the skill mix. It can increase the demand for certain skill, it can reduce the demand for certain skill. So we, it leads us to the labor market disequilibrium, which may result in higher inequality. And the structural bias technological progress is one of that theory which has, and it has been observed over, uh, worldwide that the wage inequality across the globe has increased over the last two and a half decades. But skill bias technological progress has not been able to explain the uh, labor market development, particularly in US and Europe, where there has been a polarization of labor force. Though, so the wage rate of unskilled worker and the total demand for unskilled worker has gone up. At the same time, the demand and the wage of bottom, uh, the, the, the highly skilled worker has gone up while the middle is collapsing. And there have been models which basically are task-based model. They, they divide task into abstract, routine, and manual. And they basically point out that the abstract and manual task, they are not exposed to the computerization. They are less exposed to the computerization. Basically, even, I mean, the computer basically increases the productivity of abstract task, people involved in the abstract task, but it cannot replace the manual task. But their routine task, which can be easily codified, they are at the risk of automation, so they are losing. And it has been able to explain the a recent phenomena in some of the developed countries. So here I'm going to talk about, I mean, I'm ideally I should have been talking, uh, spoken about the whole economy, but due to the data limitations, I'll be focusing only on the manufacturing sector. And I, I feel I'm justified doing, focusing only on manufacturing because this is the sector which has, which has witnessed significant technological upgradation. Uh, services, not much agriculture not much and that i will prove in the uh, in the few slides so but in order to quantify the impact of technology on labor first we have to identify or quantify the technological progress which is a very difficult task we don't have any 
measures, direct measure of technological progress. So we rely on some proxies. And one of the proxy is R&D. Now, if we look at the R&D expenditure in India as whole, uh, it has increased quite, sub quite substantially. Uh, if you can see, I mean, the total R&D expenditure was around 5,000 uh, crore rupees in 1991, which has increased to around 70,000 crore rupees. And in line with this, uh, the R&D intensity of Indian economy has also gone up. But most of this R&D in India is in the pu 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 public sector. So half of the R&D expenditure is coming from the government. And if we look at the manufacturing sector, though the R&D expenditure has gone up, but still the R&D intensity is very low. The Indian manufacturers are not spending even a half a percent of their total sale on R&D. But it has been widely documented that R&D is not the real driver of technological progress in developing countries like India. And manufacturers in these countries heavily rely on import. So what is happening there? If you look at the uh, capital imports, uh, there has been a huge surge. The total capital imports were around 5 billion US dollar in 1997-98, which has increased to around 100 billion dollar. So there has been huge increase. And the importance of capital import in uh, gross capital formation has also increased quite significantly. But if we focus simply on manufacturing sector, the share of capital import in net capital formation has been even more significant. Specifically at this, if you, if you focus on this area post 2000, around 40% of capital requirement is being met by the imported capitals. So, so there has been a lot of effort on technological upgradation in Indian manufacturing sector. Uh, there are, there are, I mean, if you are a producer in manufacturing, uh, a de developing country, you can access to some technology which may not involve the import of capital. So you can access some license and then you can pay royalty. So if you look at the royalty payment, again, the volume of royalty payment by Indian manufacturers have gone up quite substantially and royalty payment as a ratio to sale has also gone up. So if we look at the, another indicator of technological progress, so basically the share of ICT capital in total capital stock. Uh, this is one of my colleagues recently estimated for seven, eight sectors. Uh, again, the technology, the share of ICT capital has, in, has increased in the economy as a whole, but it is primarily driven by the manufacturing sector. Uh, the share of ICT capital in total uh, capital stock was less than 1%, which has increased to around 3.5%. So there has been a lot of technological upgradation over the last two decades. And interestingly, uh, I, I have shown you the data from 1991 onward, but ideally I should have started from mid-80s, because that is the time when we open up. But unfortunately, the data was not available for some of the indicators. Interestingly, uh, our technological upgradation also coincided with the jobless growth, which has been a very hot topic in the developed world. People are complaining about jobless growth, jobless growth, but we witness a quarter century of jobless growth. Starting from mid 80s till 2003-04, this is employment, organized manufacturing sector. So very low. Yes. So for 25 years, the output grew at around 8 to 9 percent average, but employment growth rate was negligible. So we had a jobless growth, and it has been widely documented. Some people argue that it was because of labor market rigidities. Some argues increase in wage rate. But no one has really talked about the technology. That's a separate issue that, that jobless growth has come to an end after 2004. So has it seventh anything to do with the technology? So in order to quantify, yeah. Before, before I quantify the impact of technology-related indicators on labor demand, Let's talk about the productivity employment decoupling. Uh, because this MIT-based, one of the MIT-based professor, uh, he 
he recently said this technological this phase of technological progress is hurting because earlier there used to be a coupling between productivity and employment so if productivity was going up it was benefiting the laborers which he is saying has broken down uh, i it's very difficult eric brings up I'm, the second name is very difficult for me to say so his argument is that the uh, there has been a decoupling between employment and uh, productivity and uh, productivity and wage rate now if we look at these three indicators so this line is basically the labor productivity and these line are productivity uh, sorry wage rate and employment these are basically indices with the base rate is uh, 93 90, uh, 1973 74 and if we look at this uh, till to mid 80s these uh, these lines were moving in tandem but and, and interestingly this is the year when we open up to the international trade and technological upgradation started and since then these uh, two these graphs i mean there there has been an increase in wage productivity gap but there has been some catching up of late but simply we can't we can't say much by simply comparing this this graph simply because we have witnessed a complete regime change till 90 till 80s it was basically the private, uh, government sector which was dominating the manufacturing sector so we don't know whether the wages were uh, determined according to the marginal productivity or not and private sector is always expected to give wage according to the marginal productivity and there has been a debate some argue that there the, the wage, wage rate in the pre-reform period was higher than the marginal productivity so what if we come no it's only formal sector yes 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 it's used but i yeah, but by definition, informal sector is the one which employs less than 10 workers. And I don't think that sector is going to witness any technological upgradation. So that's my reasoning. Because uh, if you look at the output, uh, around 70 to 80% output is from the organized sector. So that is the sector which is witnessing technological progress. Now, if we compare the... Uh, marginal productivity and wage rate uh, i find that the wages were significantly higher than the marginal product of labor till late 90s and it has come and now the marginal productivity and the wages are very much similar uh, marginal productivity is basically you have a uh, you have this uh, productivity of labor, GVA by labor, gross value added divided by labor. Then you calculate the elasticity of uh, elasticity of output with respect to the labor, and then adjust it the 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 uh, GVA by L to that figure. That's I mean it's controversial. Some people use the share of wages in total uh, uh, this uh, GVA to arrive this. But I have to. Okay. Okay. But uh, so, so in order to examine and quantify the impact of technology, I have relied on the uh, regression analysis, and I estimated the labor demand equation. Uh, so the labor demand equation is basically labor is a function of real wage rate and the output, then augmented with the uh, some certain technological indicators. Uh, I have estimated the static labor demand as well as the dynamic labor demand uh, because you have labor market rigidities, so, so you have to control for the uh, persistence in the labor employment. Uh, so uh, estimation of uh, static labor demand is, equation is straight, uh, quite straightforward. You can use fixed effect or random effect depending upon the Hosman test, but uh, dynamic panel, you have to make a choice between GMM or bias corrected LSTV model or there are there have been long differences so there are different models which you can use uh, different estimation techniques which, which you can use uh, but the kind of data set I have Monte Carlo evidence shows that the 
bias corrected LSDV model outperforms the other estimation techniques. So I have used the bias corrected uh, LSDV estimation process for my, um, for my panel. And the panel, uh, the data has basically come from the annual survey of industry. So the problem in India is that we have two data sources. One is the prowess, which is basically the firm level data. Other is ASI, which is industry level data. And the problem is, if you want to do a good study regarding technology or other variable, you can't use, you can't rely only on one. Uh, because firm level data, you don't have any information on labor. So you have to combine these, uh, these two data sources. So I combine the, those data sources and I have this 50 uh, manufacturing sectors and the, uh, the time period is from 91 to 2012. So what I get? Uh, in the first column, I have, I have this uh, lab, uh, static labor demand equation. So the Labor demand equation is well specified because the share or the, the, the coefficient of wage rate is negative as expected and significant. Uh, output positive and significant. But none of the indicator related to the technological upgradation or technological progress is significant. So there is no impact of technology, technological upgradation on labor demand. But the impact of technology, as we know from the theory, can differ. I mean, it, we may not have a linear relationship between technology and labor demand. The short term impact may differ from the long term impact. So in order to model the uh, impact of technology in a nonlinear form, I, I'm, I simply used uh, capital import and square of capital import. And if you look at the results, it shows that the capital import, by the way, I tried this, this process with other indicators, but they were not significant. So I'm showing you the only, only the final results. Uh, so we, we observe this uh, non-linear kind of a relation between capital import and labor demand. So the immediate impact is negative. So once you introduce new technology in terms of imported capital, the labor demand goes down. But over the time, the, the neg negative impact of technology on labor tapers out. So, but in order to uh, further, I mean, as a robust net check, I estimated the dynamic labor demand equation, and the story is similar. So, we don't find any lasting negative impact of technology upgradation on labor demand. But as I said, technology can impact labor without having a negative impact on overall demand. And one is the skill bias technological progress. So you introduce technology, the demand for skill goes up, and consequently, the wage inequality rises. Now, if we look at the wage inequality, uh, this line shows you the skill premium. Skill premium is basically relative wage, so skill by unskilled wage rate. Uh, it was pretty stable during 80s till mid 90s, and since then, it has gone up. So and in, the, in line with this, the share of skilled worker in total wage bill has also gone up. So there has, been an, there has been a huge increase in wage inequality in Indian manufacturing sector. So what is driving it? There have been one or two papers which have tried to estimate the determinants of wage inequality within manufacturing sector. And the argument has been, it is the skill bias technological progress. Okay. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's a very standard pr practice. Uh, you either use relative wage equation or uh, uh, relative wage share equation to quantify the impact of different variables on wage inequality. Uh, the story here is uh, inequality is driven within sector, and there has been a positive, uh, positive relation between uh, capital output ratio and uh, wage share. So it's, it's primarily driven by wage inequality. These sectors, I mean, there, there, are, there is a paper which find, a, find that ICT capital is explaining the rise in wage disparity. But these papers are pretty old, I mean, a decade old. But even if I update my result, the story is the same. The only thing is that export has also become a positive, uh, positive driver of wage inequality. But again, the increase in uh, this, this uh, ICT capital and uh, 
imported, uh, imported capital, they tend to explain around 90% of variation in wage disparity. And they, by the way, there is argument that uh, the labor market rigidities are also playing significant role. And why they say it? Because they use the contractualization as an indicator of labor market rigidities. Now in India, uh, if, you are, if, you are a, if you are an employer and you want to hire worker, then you can hire worker in two ways. You can directly hire worker or you can hire a worker through a contractor. Now, other, other facilities are similar, but the one only difference is that the worker who are hired directly, you can't fire them. You need government approval to do that. But the contractual worker don't enjoy that kind of protection. So you can fire them. So uh, intuitively, these people are very, I mean, logically they are right if they use this increase in contractualization as an indicator of labor market rigidity. But my problem is, the moment I talk about skill bias technological progress, this becomes complicating. Complicated because these contract workers, they are relatively less paid. And if we, if we take wages as a proxy of skill, they are supposed to be the unskilled labor because the attrition rate is very high. You may have one contract worker today, after a week you may have another. So, story is not really adding up and why it is not adding up and uh, yeah and even if we look at the share of because the most of the studies which have look at the skill premium they divide labor into two parts managerial and supervisory staff basically the white collar worker skilled worker and the rest are defined as unskilled worker because data doesn't allows you to go further now if we look at the share of uh, white collar worker it went up but of late it has declined to the level of 1980s but wage disparities are not declining so something is missing and the missing is if we look at i mean in, because asi data doesn't allows us to break up so i tried to uh, explore the composition of manufacturing employment by occupation within manufacturing sector. So, I've, I mean, ideally I should have gone at a much disaggregate level, but uh, the data is not comparable. So, I ended up doing this exercise for one digit level of occupation classification. I intend to, I'm, I'm working on it further, but here I will be talking about only at one digit level. So, one category is the professional and associates, very high skilled. Their share in total employment went up by three percentage point, almost doubled. Their share in wage increased three times more than the in their increase in total wage, uh, sorry, total employment. So clearly in line with the skill bias technological progress. But what is this? Elementary occupation, unskilled worker, their share in total employment actually increase more than the high skilled worker. That's a separate issue that uh, their share in wage, uh, wage bill has not increased because we have a plenty of unskilled worker. So supply side is very, I mean supply side is very, uh, we, we have a lot of supply so obviously even if the demand has gone up, their wages has not increased as much as the, this category. Another is plant and machinery operator. Their share has also gone up, which is also very much in line with skill wise technological progress. But who is, who is suffering? Craft and clerk and craft worker. Their share has declined significantly. So it is, I mean, though I have not, I have not estimated the task content or anything, but there have been studies which shows that the the uh, routine, these, these occupations are routine task incentive, intensive, sorry, intensive. So even in India and even within the manufacturing sector, we have been observing this uh, polarization of job, though certainly not the wage rate. So to conclude, uh, significant technological upgradation, uh, technolo new technology reduces labor demand but negative impact tapers off with time, vertical increase in wage inequality, but skill-wise technological progress doesn't explain it. Uh, 
job, there are signs of job polarization. So what can be done? Uh, we need, I mean, if we, if we think that these are the trends going to persist over the time, then we may need a lot of updation in our vocational education because the, the, this craft related uh, occupation, it includes like painter, welder, molder, and these, I mean, though I need to do it, go it further to, uh, to, uh, to make this point more precisely, but I somehow feel because, my, because some of anecdotes and my, my interaction with the people, that these occupations are not really in demand in the Indian manufacturing sector. Uh, again, there should be high emphasis on the higher education, specifically on the quality, because uh, if you look at the higher education, it has increased. But uh, quality is a big issue. And more importantly, more than these, basic education, educational disparity should be addressed, because in India, we have very dualistic so, okay, I'll leave it. Okay. Actually, uh, I I got this uh, PPT uh, the same day as uh, I won't get mine, so it's uh, quite fair. <laughs> and uh, I also uh, also I I <laughs> no, that's also also we I only read PPT here. So as I have, maybe I have some misunderstanding about the, the paper. So, but so the first thing is why why think I'm I'm thinking the 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 paper is interesting because in China we 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 have already had some some uh, uh, discussion about the the the, the de development pattern of the chi uh, China between China and India. So this kind of uh, comparison is always interesting. So the, from this paper, I, I find. You, 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 before I heard the story that uh, India has um, uh, quick development in, in service sector, and that is the driver of the economic growth. That's the story I heard before. But from this paper, I, I, I find is actually there, there is st uh, still a significant increase of employment in manufacturing. And the end of the uh, job growth in the past few years, which means this is ki actually kind of similar pattern to, to, to China. We, we have a, a a huge development in, in, in manufacturing and uh, in, especially in the labor intensive sectors. So to me, this, this message uh, seems that actually we, we have followed the, the same pattern of economic development at the early stage of uh, 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 economic development. And also, uh, he introduced to, to us the, the technological uh, progress in India in manufacturing um, through through capital imports, but I'm not very clear in, in which way. They just import machine or th or through FDI. I think in, in China we we at the early stage of economic development we, we we use FDI to to actually import the technology. So that could be uh, I mean FDI could be uh, uh, more. Uh, to to the the comparative advantage in, in the in endowment in China, but if you only import the, the machine, it's a, I'm I'm not sure it's if it's a similar way to China, but it's interesting. And also, we find we find the paper they say the significant improvement in productivity. Uh, I actually, is that the way the way to support the fast growth in the in, in the past few years for for India? Since you have the significant improvement in in productivity in manufacturing sector, is one of the driver of the economic growth. It's a, this is a interesting to me. And also, you know, the paper said new technology reduces labor demand. Also, uh, some other factors, especially the the spill over effect should, should be a count. Um, but it's just your uh, finding here, it's interesting. And I, I just have a few questions and no, no more comments about it. It's, it I mean, the, for me, it's a, the, 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 pic, the big picture is a interesting. That is, is India following the strategy of developing the intensive sector, including the manufacturing? I mean, in, we, we, we don't have the message about the, this, this manufacturing sector. Is, is it lab intensive or just, uh, I mean, 
very high skill uh, sector. I'm I'm not sure as well that, that, that but, I, uh, but this is, it should be a very important question since in, in India is the reach of the human resources uh, actually is um, maybe the largest will be the largest population uh, can, uh, um, country with the population. And also, why the skill premium decline since you, you, th you think the skill based technology change happening in India? Uh, I, it's to, it's to me, it's a, if, if the, the skill based technology is, it should incre increase the skill premium. And uh, I'm not very clear about that. And also, why the job are polarized in growing employment in, in with growing employment in manufacturing? I mean, in, in particular, if it's at the early stage of economic development, we should find this kind of upgrading the each each uh, um, position. And uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting paper. I mean, in particular for the from the reader, uh, the readers from from, from China. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, so I think so I have two comments that are related, and I think we uh, also related some was mentioned before. So I'm not sure if we can draw much conclusion on the relationship between technology and employment, just based on data in manufacturing sector. After all, it's less than half of the total em employment in the economy. Um, so a second related one is. One of the things that I think is quite important for the content of India is it has extremely low female labor, fa labor force participation. So recently I saw an article, I can't see the speaker. Recently I saw, uh, uh, recently I saw an article in The Economist saying that if uh, all the women uh, went into the labor force, you know, get the labor force participant rate, like what is we observe among those highest. India is one of the highest one that will have the most gain in GDP. And then if you think about where women go to work, most likely is in the service sector. So, um, so in, in, when you were drawing policy implication about education, what should be done, I think there's something very intrinsically we have to study is what's going on into the, in the woman in the labor market for India. Was it some social norm that woman's not coming in or is it some barrier in creating job in the service sector, for example? If you look into the future, what, we, what kind of job other than just art or people mentioned before, I think health and caring sector is the one of the most important when you look at other you know, developed countries. Those are the sectors that grow very fast. Um, I, I don't know how robots take care of um, people, you know. So nursing, for example, is one of the very important jobs and not many people are, you know, taking up and, you know, I don't know. I think that's m something quite important for India to look at in for the future. We are, we are producing surplus nurses. I mean, if you go to Gulf, <laughs> so basically you'll find Indian nurses. So they are taking up. Rest, I'll respond. Albert. Um, so uh, one challenge you have is you the firm level data has very little information on labor. So at the end, you do some analysis of occupations from the NSS data. But I it wasn't clear to me whether that sample was specific to manufacturing or organized manufacturing. Uh, because maybe all those craftsmen are the household uh, producers who you excluded from the, who are not included in the other samples. So I'm not sure how, how that applies to understanding the firm level results. Okay. Uh, okay, I have another question. Uh, two points. The first point is maybe people are uh, also interested in the uh, long run effects of the uh, technology change on employment growth. So maybe at least you can do one thing, that is to lack the uh, measurements of those technology change or the uh, technology level, uh, maybe for one or two or three years to see whether there are some uh, lack the effects of uh, technology change on employment. The second point is uh, maybe it's also necessary to study the complementarities between um, service and uh, um, industry uh, manufacturing sector because I, I'm interested in 
uh, to know uh, whether the uh, job growth in the service sector is driven by the technology change in the manufacturing sector in India, or it's just because of outsourcing from other countries like the United States. So, um, in theory, if the productivity in the manufacturing sector is growing, it can generate more service demand. So, I mean, for a developing country like India, it's very important for us to know whether the technology change in the manufacturing sector will generate enough jobs to absorb those surplus laborers. Or the service development in India is only uh, outsourcing of the uh, demand from outside. That's very important for us to judge the future. Okay. Yeah. So. More like a policy re related question. Now, if I understand correctly, like did India tries to follow the one of the industrialization path right now to become the second China in a way. But then like if you look for example like Latin American countries then they the manufacturing employment they're picked at much lower levels than like in this part of the world or in Europe earlier. So has that affected the and then there is the argument that it's because of the technology, because you need more less workers or you can have more factories back again in the US with more robots. Is that affecting the like the approach to the industrial policy in India? Now or not at all yet? Uh, see, I mean, I accept this criticism. I mean, uh, this is a very, no, okay. It's a very narrow, I mean, I have focused only on the manufacturing sector and uh, uh, we can't, we can't journalize, but the, here the main purpose was because uh, if you look at, uh, I mean, we have this very stringent labor laws and there has been an argument that due to this labor laws uh, the 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 kind of technology we are uh, we are using in india it is not compatible with our uh, factory endowment and and i mean there is a nice paper by rana which where he shows that the uh, capital intensity of manufacturing sector in india is way higher as compared to the other countries of similar which are at similar level of development so i mean i have focused on that only and and so i mean yes uh, I should I should include uh, more uh, uh, all the sectors, but again the problem is our more than 55 percent of our work, uh, workforce is involved in the agriculture sector. So uh, it doesn't make any sense to include that sector in the analysis. But yes, services should be a part of it, and I have not been able to do it because uh, you have to use this occupation-wise data. But the problem is there has been a significant change in the classification in 2004 earlier we were using 1990s 1960 so you can't go back uh, you can't go back beyond 2004 without doing some sort of concordance i tried it was not working out but i'm doing it maybe uh, after one or two months or three months i'll be able to share those results with you uh, professor lu's comment uh, well taken i tried with lag I have not shown it here because this paper was presented uh, a week before in a conference in New Delhi and there the time was only 12 minutes. So I just, I did not include it those nitty gritty here, but lag was not working. Uh, I mean, if you want, I can, I can share those results with you. Uh, Professor Park's comment, uh, yes, the, the occupation wise data, it, it is only regarding the manufacturing sector. No other sector is included. Uh, female participation, yes, I mean, you are right. Uh, but I haven't looked at it. <laughs> uh, so the comment, uh, this uh, labor intensive, I mean, I have a slide. I haven't shown it here. Unfortunately, we have not been able to specialize in the uh, labor intensive sectors. And the growth has, manufacturing growth has largely come from the very capital intensive sector. And if you can judge something from, if export can give an indicator of our specialization, uh, around one third of our exports are coming from very highly capital intensive sector, our petroleum refinery and pharmaceuticals, these sectors, one third of our export. Uh, the share of unskilled labor intensive export was around 30% when we started liberalizing. It has decline to 10%. So uh, unfortunately, we have not been able to do so. And the debate is uh, mainly this 
labor laws are the problem and that's why the these sectors are not expanding uh, fdi i have not i have not uh, included in these regressions because we don't have the data of fdi at three digit level uh, but again one can work out a proxy and i did this exercise 5 6 year back uh, maybe i can extend that and include but at that time i find uh, fdi was not really significant because if you look at the share of foreign and joint venture firm in total manufacturing sector it is still around 10% so not very much high and that's not the new i mean before uh, before liberalization around 7% the, these joint venture and foreign firm they had around 7% share in manufacturing sector so despite all who and cry regarding this fdi their share has only gone by uh, 3 percentage points that's it